Dr. Paul Harch, MD, is director of LSU HSC Medical Center of Louisiana in New Orleans, hyperbaric, hyperbaric medicine and wound care department. He is also the medical director of LSU Hyperbaric Medicine and Wound Care Fellowship Program and clinical associate professor. In 1990, he adapted Dr. Richard Neubauer's discovery of low-pressure hyperbaric oxygen therapy for neurological injury to divers with chronic brain decompression illness. The success with these divers was extended to patients with nearly 70 other cerebral diagnoses over the next 18 years, including the first children with CP and autism to be treated with HBOT in the U.S. By invitation, he has presented his work to Congress on three separate occasions and last year duplicated his human work in an animal model that represents the first ever improvement of chronic brain injury in animals. His experience with HBOT in neurological inju injury was published last year in a book called The Oxygen Revolution. This year, he successfully applied his low-pressure protocol to U.S. military veterans with TBI and PTSD from the current wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. He currently is enrolling wounded veterans in a pilot trial of HBOT, the results of which will be used to refine a larger study that was awarded a $1.2 million appropriation by Congress on September 30th of this year. We are very proud to welcome Dr. Paul Harch. See it. First of all, thank you for the invitation to speak here. I have to say that of all the conferences I've attended, um, I have taken more home from this than the vast majority of them, uh, if not all of them. Uh, one other thing I want to say is, uh, thanks to Dr. Sprecher, I found out uh, what I am, uh, or at least my philosophy. I I'm a functional medicine doctor, and you're going to see that what I have to say here dovetails very nicely with what she was talking about yesterday, and that I'm going to show you a treatment that affects basic disease processes and not necessarily symptoms. So to get started, <laughs> there we go. I'm going to start with some case presentations. This is traumatic brain injury from 1993. And it was a 19-year-old male, had severe TBI on December 22nd of 1989. He was in a motor vehicle accident, ended up with a Glasgow coma scale of six to seven, underwent prolonged rehabilitation. Two and a half years later was referred to me with inappropriate social behavior, cognitive deficits, perseveration, required constant supervision, 24 hours a day. And what we did was a series of spec brain blood flow imaging and hyperbaric oxygen over the course of the next uh, eight months, which were interrupted by hurricanes. And the results were an improvement in his social behavior, cognition, perseveration. He was advanced to assisted living, part-time employment, and subsequently lived in a group home. Neuropsych testing showed some improvement, and he periodically returned to hyperbaric oxygen in New Orleans to tell me I feel so much better in my head and can do new things when I have hyperbaric oxygen. Well, these are spec brain scans, and uh, this is nuclear medicine applied to CT, so we, these are the transverse images, and on the left is going from the top of the brain in a stack of pancakes down to about the middle of the brain, here is after one hyperbaric treatment, and the colors, color code for this, highest brain blood flow is this bright white yellow going down through orange to purple, blue, and black. And what you see, uh, each one of these images, we're looking up from the patient's foot. So right ear is here, left ear is here, front of the face, and the back of the head. And if you look at the diffuse heterogeneous pattern on here with this variability in perfusion, especially on this lower row, and you look what happens after one hyperbaric treatment, there's a fairly dramatic improvement in brain blood flow. Here's the lower half of the brain. Similarly, and I want you to key in on this here, which is the right frontal lobe, and look how severely underperfused it is compared to the left side. Look what happens after one treatment. If we look down here as well, take a look at the temporal lobes, which normally sit here and here. 
There's very little, but now we see some flow after even one treatment, and the right cerebellum, non-existent, there after one treatment. Well, here he is after the series of 80 hyperbaric treatments, and we can see, again, a generalized improvement in flow if you just look at the pattern and the filling in of many of these defects. And, of course, right frontal lobe. Look what's happened after a series of hyperbaric treatments. Right cerebellum, temporal lobes. You can see the flow has been reestablished. Well, there's a cognitive test for this, at least for the frontal lobes, called the Ray Osterreth complex figure. And what they do is they show this complex diagram of the patient, and he sits there and copies it. They then take it away and ask him with immediate recall to try to reconstruct it. And this is before hyperbaric oxygen. You see he loses scale and he loses detail. 30 minutes later, they ask him to draw it again. And now we're becoming more elongated. We've lost more scale and detail. Here he is after hyperbaric oxygen. Immediate copy, or, or the copy, immediate uh, memory, and there he is with delayed memory. So we had not only an improvement in brain blood phone metabolism, but a psychometric test that matched the improvement we saw clinically. How about chronic stroke? 68-year-old man, multiple lacunar strokes on MRI. Last one was two and a half years prior to hyperbaric oxygen. Symptoms, intractable dizziness, imbalance, cane dependence, housebound. He didn't want to go out of his home because he was afraid he would fall in public and have to have some woman help him up. And he was a very proud older guy. Uh, left body incoordination, poor motor control, and depressed as a result of this. Told me the only reason he wanted to live was that he had grandchildren. Otherwise, his quality of life was extremely poor. Spec brain blood flow imaging, one hyperbaric treatment to assess the response, repeat spec, and then we did a series of 80 hyperbaric treatments in two blocks over the next six months. And what did we end up with? A decrease in his dizziness, improved balance. Essentially, all of his major complaints were improved. His physical exam was improved. He stopped using his left knee brace, stopped using his cane, would go out in public. And the brain imaging matched this in terms of his general improvement. And unfortunately, these things are cut off at the bottom and the top. However, I want you to see, again, the variability and generalized improvement in flow on matching images. And it's a little more apparent on the lower half of the brain if we look at, take a look at the right temporal lobe here and what happens after a single treatment. Similarly, right cerebellar lobe after a single treatment. And these changes are generally on all of the slices. Here he is before and after now, the whole series of hyperbaric treatments. And what you see is this more smooth, normal appearance of the brain as opposed to this alternating kind of rainbow appearance of colors. Same with the lower half of the brain. Improvement in cerebellum on every one of those images. Right temporal lobe, he now has flow. And here's the three-dimensional reconstruction. What the computer does is set a threshold and you take the outermost pixel on the slices and the computer will reconstruct it. So we're looking at his brain face on. Forehead would be right here, so this is right, left frontal lobe. Here are the two temporal lobes that sit kind of behind and uh, I should say in from the ear. And you can see the right temporal lobe, how low the blood flow is, right cerebellum also. This is after one treatment. And that was at the conclusion of his series of treatments. How about cerebral decompression sickness? This is where all this began for me. 1991, 49-year-old guy, sports scuba diver, went diving down to the Cayman Islands, twice a day dives, one week dive trip, drinking heavily in the evenings, flies home to Louisiana, and guess what? He's dizzy, off balance, uncoordinated, has decreased hearing, ringing in his ears, he's irritable as can be, and he has cognitive deficits. He eventually saw an ENT doc about 30 days after his injury when he was really having problems functioning. And they find a number of abnormalities on him. And he called me up and said, you do, you, know, you do diving medicine. Uh, can you do anything for this guy? It's 30 days out. And I told him, well, uh, nobody really treats injury this far out for diving. It's considered untreatable neurological disease. So I ended up doing the sequence of SPECT, single hyperbaric treatment, repeat SPECT, and started treating him and each week asking him, are you improving or have you stopped? This was unheard of. Navy protocols, one, two treatments and you're done. And every week this man is getting better, symptomatically, physical exam. When we're done, he says, 
Well, how are you doing? Well, I'm not going to kill anybody anymore. What are you talking about? Well, during that period of great irritability, he had threatened to turn his workplace into a post office over some lively banter at the coffee machine in the morning. This guy just couldn't take a joke, literally. Um, and what happened over the years was he returned for periodic booster, as he called them, hyperbaric treatments. In fact, I just treated him uh, about two weeks ago. Well, his scan here, the color, uh, don't pay so much attention. I want you to look more at smoothness. This is before and after a single hyperbaric treatment. Normal brain blood flow at rest, unstimulated in a human being, is in a very narrow range between about 45 and 65 cc's per 100 grams of brain tissue per minute. And what that translates to on a color map is very little change in color. It gives you a smooth appearance, a constant color, almost like smeared pastel. In brain injury, especially one that affects the whole brain, you get a heterogeneous pattern where you've got a bright area, purple, not so bright, bright, not so bright, and this string of rosary beads around. And what ends up is an irregular pattern. Look down here in his basal ganglia, left basal ganglia, right basal ganglia, and after treatment, he becomes more symmetric. Same with the thalamus. Here's the lower half of the brain, and this is another one with the cross cerebellar diaschesis, which is a hard finding in nuclear medicine, one treatment, Significant improvement. Well, here he is before and after the whole series of treatments. Again, a very smooth and more normal pattern to brain blood flow. Symptomatically, he is better. There's the lower half of the brain. You can take a look up at the top here. Take a look at these right frontal lobe defects here and what happens. Fills in. Went back to work. He's a meteorologist at NOAA. He worked another 15 years. Well, here's his three-dimensional reconstruction. You can see bilateral frontal lobe defects, right temporal lobe affected, right cerebellar lobe, one hyperbaric treatment, and a whole series of hyperbaric treatments. This is untreatable neurological disease. How about cerebral palsy? Eight-year-old boy, hemiplegic CP, a whole host of problems. Spasticity, uncontrollable behavior, cognitive problems, attention, concentration, constipated, he has an autonomic injury, he's incontinent, eight years of age, boy, that's no fun. Scan, dive, scan sequence under an experimental protocol that we were using at the time. Hyperbaric oxygen in two blocks, repeated his spec, reevaluated him, had a generalized improvement in all of his major dysfunctions. And here are now the sagittal images, so remember, Constancy, or I should say normal human, at rest, unstimulated brain has a narrow range of blood flow. Look how variable this is. We've got purple, we've got blue areas, we've got yellow gaps. Here's one hyperbaric treatment. And here he was at the end of the series. Now, you don't have to be a radiologist to read this. Here's his 3D. I want you to concentrate on his temporal lobes and the inferior frontal lobes. That's baseline, one treatment, and a series of treatments. How about Alzheimer's? 58-year-old, architect, diagnosed with Alzheimer's 500 years, or five and a half years, excuse me, before, that's not Alzheimer's, that's real dementia. <laughs> Uh, started on Aricept, continued to decline. They added uh, or switched to neotropin. Then they started Exelon. They increased it uh, to a maximum level six weeks before hyperbarics. He started CPAP because they diagnosed that likely the cause of his Alzheimer's may have been his sleep apnea for 12 years. Uh, his wife noted some improvement with the Exelon, but he plateaued. He came down to New Orleans, and I ended up treating him with a series of hyperbaric treatments. And what we saw was a progressive slow improvement. The neuropsychologists at the University of Oklahoma who were testing him saw for the first time in his testing that he not only stabilized but had an improvement in memory. Here are his baseline scans, and what I want you to do is keep an eye on There's some funkiness with the, uh, there we go. Okay, I want you to keep an eye on the classic areas back here where Alzheimer's is manifest. And you can see the gaps and so on. As we go through one treatment, 40 treatments, and 80, you're going to see these fill in. You see how it becomes more confluent back here in all of these images? That was one treatment. This is 40. And I'm sorry, it deleted it. That, that was 80. I think we'll get all the 3Ds on this, however. 
Here are the three-dimensional reconstructions, and we're looking at him. This is his baseline scan, and you can see big areas of damage. That's the right lateral, the left lateral, and here is the top-down view. And you can see the big areas that are uh, watershed areas typically identified as abnormal in uh, Alzheimer's. So that's baseline, one hyperbaric treatment, 40 hyperbaric treatments, and 80. This is artifact. He was outside the scanner. So we have improvement in brain blood flow, improvement in his Fulstein mini mental status, it went from nine to 13, and improvement in his memory scores. Alcoholism and subacute stroke. Middle-aged man ended up with, uh, essentially from his alcoholism, had a cardiac problem, atrial fibrillation from a cardiomyopathy, and was on, this isn't changing, was on um, uh, uh, Coumadin to prevent uh, coagulation. Went off his Coumadin because he was drinking, ended up with a clot in the atrium, had an embolus, didn't make it to the ER in time, uh, and uh, ended up with severe uh, stroke symptoms. Um, and a month afterward, uh, called up and wanted to know if hyperbaric oxygen could help him. And I didn't realize it, but when he came down to New Orleans, he was drinking the whole time I was treating him. What you're going to see, yeah, what you're going to see on this is, number one, you can see the big area that is stroked here. But in addition, he's got this diffuse heterogeneous pattern to the rest of the brain. Well, here he is after one hyperbaric treatment. And what you see now is all of these other affected areas. We didn't have a big change in the stroked area, but the rest of the alcohol-damaged brain seemed to respond to this. Uh, I had him on video, and when I was interviewing him, he had dense left-sided neglect, very slow with his speech. This man was a multimillionaire, entrepreneur, uh, and he had had turnover power of attorney to, uh, of his companies to his sons. And after this very first treatment, he was up at the scanner, and they called me from the hospital, and they said, uh, your patient wants you to come over here immediately. I said, oh, I hope we don't have a problem. No, 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 he said he has to talk to you, and he's perched right in front of the door that you come into from the back area of nuclear medicine. I walked through the door, and this guy who was speaking in a very slow and methodical cadence and having trouble putting his sentences together says to me, Dr. Harsh, have you thought of the entrepreneurial possibilities of establishing neurological treatment centers with hyperbaric oxygen? <laughs> I didn't need to go look at his scan. <laughs> Anyways, we treated him. He had a marked improvement in his motor activity on the affected side of the body. We didn't see it so much on his imaging, uh, but the rest of his brain, here it is after the treatment, has this smoother appearance. And as I said, he was still drinking while we were treating him. He subsequently got power of attorney back from his sons, took control of his company. Here's the 3D from the right side. You can see the big defect where the stroke is. Uh, one treatment, a little bit of a difference. And then after 40 treatments, not much difference really in the size of that big stroked area. But the rest of the brain was more affected and responded. Well, how about dementia, which I like to call normal aging these days. Uh, because it doesn't seem like we can have a good diagnosis of uh, dementia and what it is. But this is a 72-year-old guy who, as we found out, was being propped up by his wife uh, until she died. And uh, I, got a, I thought that was fixed. <laughs> That's faster than I could talk. Um, long story short, he had a, uh, uh, a number of GI bleeds. He was fully demented, and he got on the road to go visit his family and in the process got stopped by police, ended up in hospitals, diagnosed with dementia, given some fluid for dehydration, and discharged. And they finally called me up when he reached his, uh, the home of his relatives, and he was getting up in the middle of the night, all of his clothes off, and chasing the children around the house. And uh, I said, you know, we've been trying to get him treated for a number of months. Whatever you do, don't put him on a plane because you're going to be at 8,000 feet altitude, cabin depressurization, oxygen is 73% of surface. I said he'll be hypoxic in flight and you're going to have a meltdown. Well, the next phone call I got was from Houston. The federal marshals took him off the plane because he decompensated in flight, had a psychotic type of episode, and got hospitalized with this psychosis and was diagnosed with pneumonia and sent out. He finally came over and we treated him. And what I'm going to show you, here is his brain scan at baseline, 
And you can see, now he's also, this was a chronic smoker drinker. He'd been knocked out in a bunch of bar fights, and he had a carbon monoxide episode. So that's why I talk about normal aging. Uh, this was, I guess, a normally aged uh, man in America. I hope not. But uh, anyways, take a look at all of these areas that temporal lobes bilaterally, frontal lobes. And here he was after one hyperbaric treatment. And there he was after a series of 40 in one month. He now went back to independent living. This guy was under 24-hour supervision before that. Uh, I found out he just died two months ago, but that was five years ago. Cost savings there was immense, not to mention quality of life. How about toxic brain injury? Biggest chemical spill in the United States, Bogalusa, Louisiana in 1994, I think it was, nitric oxide and oxides of nitrogen. Essentially, a rail car had exploded and spewed uh, chemicals all over the city, and uh, quite a few people were caught. And this is a very well-known person in that city who was one of the first responders. Everybody was rushed in, first responders, to a gaseous poison explosion and nobody had any respiratory protection. So all the firemen, all the police, all the paramedics were injured, both lung and brain. And talk about heterogeneity. Here is the brain scan over, uh, what, a year now, almost, it was 96. It was a year after the injury. And you can see this diffuse heterogeneous pattern. And there is one month of hyperbaric oxygen. Here's his 3D before and 3D after, symptomatically, markedly improved. So what's going on here? Eight different diagnoses, six different and or mixed pathologies, seven chronic or stable clinical states, one was subacute, the decompression, a single therapeutic modality, and eight identical, let's call them very similar, clinical and blood flow imaging results. The suggestion here is that hyperbaric oxygen is acting in a generic fashion as a generic drug for generic chronic brain pathology. If we try to look at this in globo, we can pretty much divide these into neurological and intellectual disabilities. What is a neurological disability? It's a disability that has dysfunction in a number of areas, memory, cognitive functioning, sensory motor skills, speech language, organizational skills, information processing, affect, social skills, or the basic life functions. And examples of these are numerous. The list is too long, but just to give you an idea, I mean, CP, MS, muscular dystrophy, apraxia, traumatic brain injury, strokes, Parkinson's, epilepsy, autism, etc. cetera. And uh, uh, according to the uh, definition, um, intellectual disability is an IQ below 70 to 75, significant limitations in two or more adaptive skill areas that are manifest before the age of 18. Well, the adaptive skill areas, there are 10 of them, communication, self-care, home living, social skills, et cetera, et cetera. In the U.S., it's estimated there are about 7.5 million people with intellectual disabilities, which is about 2.5 to 3% of the population. Most of them are elected to office in Washington, D.C. every year. In the world, it's about 156 million people in 1994, so the number is much higher now. There are several hundred causes for intellectual disabilities. Without reading that whole thing, Down syndrome is one of the most common, but you can see there are genetic conditions, there are problems during pregnancy, use of alcohol and drugs, fetal alcohol syndrome is one of the most common ones, malnutrition, rubella, glandular disorders, diabetes, physical malformations, HIV infection, uh, problems at birth, premature and low birth weight, uh, problems after birth, infectious causes, trauma, uh, near drowning, toxic injury to the brain, and poverty, of course, all the things that go with poverty. We know it's not good to be poor. Uh, malnutrition, uh, inadequate medical care, environmental health hazards, um, et cetera, et cetera, understimulation, irreversible brain injury. Essentially, neurological and intellectual disabilities are chronic brain injuries of a variety of different causes. But nearly all of them share a common factor, which is an organic brain injury. And the key here is that regardless of the type of insult, if we take infection, trauma, loss of blood flow, i.e. ischemia, hypoxia, 
uh, run electricity through the brain, as in lightning. Um, just about any of these causes, there are subtle and not so subtle differences with the acute primary injury. But the second the injury is imparted, what happens? The inflammatory process takes over. And it's like playing a DVD or, or a you know, VHS tape from start to finish. It's stereotypic, and it goes through a stereotypic pathological sequence. And what happens is, at the end of the day, we've got fairly common generic pathology with many of these different types of uh, causes to neurological and intellectual disability. And it's this common pathology that's the target of hyperbaric oxygen. Acutely, surprisingly, even though there are differences in the different types of insults, hyperbaric oxygen are, uh, acts in a very common way there on reperfusion injury. And I don't have time to go into that today. So what I wanted to look at was mostly hyperbaric oxygen in chronic neurological conditions. And there's a refined definition now, which is, and this goes to Dr. Sprecher's comment, hyperbaric oxygen is the use of greater than atmospheric pressure oxygen as a drug to treat basic disease processes and or states, and hence the diseases. So what we're doing is treating the root cause of the problem. And what's been shown now throughout the years with hyperbaric research is that you can grow new tissue, increase fibroblast proliferation, increase bone mineral density and healing, angiogenesis, epithelialization. You can change the oxygen capacitance. And just last year, it was shown that in normal humans and mice, repetitive high-pressure treatments release our own stem cells from our bone marrow into the circulation. And they claim that they home to extremity wounds. Didn't measure it in the brain. The prototypic model for angiogenesis in hyperbaric medicine is the external beam radiation necrosis model. And as you know, for head and neck cancer, it's Dr. Marx who worked this out, for head and neck cancer, external beam radiation, any external beam radiation, will impart a thromboangitis obliterans at the center of the radiation beam. And at some point, there's a gradient of perfusion and that gradient of perfusion establishes an oxygen gradient. Sometimes, depending on the radiation dose, this can be a matter of weeks or months. Other times, it's years. If you do one hyperbaric treatment, you steepen that gradient pretty dramatically, and it skipped a slide. But as you do this repetitively, you grow new blood vessels in. And let me go back, because I want to show you that sequence a little bit better. Well, it deleted it. It's not on there. But anyways, what happens is, uh, we have this one hyperbaric treatment will steepen that to about 300 millimeters. And then repetitively over time with repetitive hyperbaric oxygen, you will grow new blood vessels in. What's happened is they've measured this out now over 10 years, looking at PO2 in the normal mandible versus PO2 in the radiated one. And what you achieve is about an 80% of normal oxygen level, which is durable as far out as they've measured it. So what we're doing is we are stimulating growth of new tissue that remains for years and years. Well, when this was first discovered, people didn't know the intervening mechanisms. I mean, if you plug in hyperbaric oxygen on a daily basis and the output is growth of new tissue, what do you have to do? You have got to somehow go through the DNA to stimulate production of new cells. And what's happened now in the last 10 years with molecular biochemical techniques is they've shown that we are upregulating platelet-derived growth receptor mRNA, changing oxidant capacitance, platelet-derived growth factor receptor is increased, growth factor receptor increased, downregulation of intracellular adhesion molecule, which is more for acute injury, increase in vascular endothelial growth factor in acute wounding, and an increase in procollagen mRNA. So look at the precursors here. Of, of protein synthesis. The only way you can get MRA is by stimulating the DNA. Well, the question arises is how much additional oxygen over atmospheric pressure is necessary for DNA signaling and upregulation of growth and repair hormones? And the answer is we don't know for sure exactly in any given patient, but it appears that there's an entire range of oxygen signaling that can occur, all the way from just supplemental to hyperbaric conditions. So, if we could review that, this goes back to the 1600s. Between the 1600s and the late 1890s in Europe, 
hyperbaric medicine, if you will, flourished. There were what, call, what were called pressure baths in many of the major cities, and people would go in these and stay for hours at a time to treat whatever malady they had. They eventually died out, and I'm not sure exactly why. It's not recorded well. I have a feeling it's got to do to, uh, or has to do with uh, lack of explanation of the science behind it, but I also think they probably generated decompression sickness in a lot of these people. Uh, you go in and stay for hours at 60, 65 feet and come out, you can end up with decompression sickness. Well, what happened in the early 30s, or uh, early 1900s, up to 1930 in the United States, Dr. Cunningham, University of Kansas City Medical School, while he was in Colorado looking over Great Gorge, was realizing that the Spanish flu had a much higher mortality, as did other conditions, at altitude. And so if a reduction in oxygen via altitude had such an effect on, on uh, a worsening of disease, maybe a slight increase might help disease. And so as he put his chamber in in Kansas City before it was even up and running, they were going to test it in animals, he was brought a dying medical student from Spanish flu. And he put him in and treated him and saved this guy's life. Well, the pressures, it turns out, he was using just air. Hadn't been using oxygen. Well, was 1.3 atmospheres. So a 30% improvement in pressure and oxygen was enough to benefit the lungs and salvage a variety of these patients. Well, he started treating all sorts of things. And this, to this day, he is uh, uh, one of the few people who's ever been able to reverse the positive syphilis test. Um, but it, this uh, really was dormant for years until 1970 when Dr. Neubauer began applying one and a half atmosphere, 100% oxygen over here in Lauderdale-by-the-Sea to multiple sclerosis and chronic stroke. In 1989, I was telling some of the people in the back here a little bit earlier, this started for me with a guy with an acute paralysis from a motor vehicle accident. And we were able to reverse this paralysis. He walked out of the hospital in 17 days. From there, I started treating a variety of neurological conditions over this range of pressures and oxygen uh, concentrations. In 2001, Colette made a mistake in the CP randomized prospective trial they did in Montreal and thought they'd give a placebo to the control group. What they gave was 1.3 atmospheres of air. The oxygen group got too much oxygen. And what did they have statistically? Significant improvements, far greater than physical therapy or any other therapies achieve in both groups. And what was the answer? 1.3 of air had a beneficial effect on that pediatric brain injury. Heuser, 2002, 24% oxygen, same low pressure, looking at injury in autism, toxic brain injury. Rosinal in 2006, 1.3 of 28% on autism. So the point is what we're getting is evidence across this whole spectrum that hyperbaric oxygen, or I should say even increased amounts of oxygen, can signal DNA and affect changes. Well, how did this begin for me? It started with that paralyzed patient and then the divers and started asking questions about the divers, had a conversation with Dr. Neubauer, and it was based on Dr. Neubauer's idling neuron hypothesis, which is what I was showing you with the imaging. What he did was take a lady, 60 years old, 14 years post-stroke, major middle cerebral artery stroke, and here she is before hyperbarics, and this was one treatment, and look what happened out here, a differential increase in blood flow. And the idea was after 14 years, you could have brain tissue that wasn't just dead or alive, but alive and non-functional. Well, we know that's true for stunned myocardium. We know it for the lung. We know it for all sorts of tissues. He treated this lady repetitively and had a significant improvement in function over the next 16 months. This was untreatable neurological disease. Well, we started doing this in divers and boxers. Eventually, we did an IRB-approved study looking at close to 200 patients. And the purpose was to evaluate this Neubauer effect. And what we found was that this was acting in a generic way across a lot of different pathologies. And I don't know how much time I have left here, so I'm going to hurry up a little bit. OK, so we had an independent review of this done by one of the world's experts in spec brain imaging. And what we found were significant changes in, sig in blood flow in significant areas of the brain. Well, what finally happened, I presented this at a lot of meetings. And you know, this is scientists. Well, you know, those are just old cases. It's not really believable unless you have an animal model. So what I do? We adapted the focal head bonk model of cortical brain injury. Well-known model. You drop a weight on the brain bonk. Actually, we take a little piece of bone out first. But you drop a little weight on the brain. 
And uh, within 30 days, what happens is it's like a focal cortical stroke, but you also contuse the underlying hippocampus. And the rats end up with a spatial learning and memory defect. And you can measure this. So it's a long story, but the short was we did a controlled experimental trial in animals. And we had three groups. We had an altitude control group that stayed in Albuquerque. Uh, and we had two groups that we brought to New Orleans. So we went from 5,600 feet altitude to sea level. And what we measured was blood vessel density on the side of the injury. And you can see, over time, uh, the animals have a little bit of improvement in blood vessel density as the healing takes place. The air group that came to New Orleans had a little bit more, probably because they came to sea level, then back to altitude, and the hypoxic stimulus then stimulates angiogenesis, we believe. But the hyperbaric group had a major improvement in blood vessel density. Well, simultaneously, look what happened to cognition. The rats are on a 270-day slide where they lose progressively more and more memory ability. The altitude group is on that slide. Coming to sea level and going back to a hypoxic environment was a bozo no-no. These guys didn't do very good. But the hyperbaric oxygen did. And the correlation between this and the improvement in blood vessel density was 0.64, which is highly significant. Well, so what happened here? I, you know, the normal FDA drug approval process is in vitro, test tube, petri dish, small animal, large animal, primates, Europeans, and then if we don't kill a bunch of foreigners, we bring it to the States and we do some real research, right? And then we get it approved. And what we've been doing in humans for years and years was exactly this, had to turn around and do it in animals. And that's the way the article reads. It was published in Brain Research last year that we've been doing this in humans for years, but we had to show it in animals. Actually, I wanted to make the statement more provocative, but my co-author wouldn't let me. Um, so what, what the conclusion here is that low-pressure hyperbaric oxygen appears to be a promising generic drug for chronic brain injury of many different causes. Now, I didn't show you a whole bunch of randomized prospective double-blinded blindedness. And I got to... Thank Dr. Uh, Philip James for that quote. Actually, his quote is uncontrolled, randomized, prospective, double-blinded blindedness. The studies actually are slowly coming about, some of them in pediatric brain injury. Um, and there's one caveat I want to leave you with. Uh, after doing this for years in approximately 70 patients with chronic traumatic brain injury of all degrees of severity, last uh, or earlier this year, uh, I applied this to... Um, four or five of our veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan with traumatic brain injury and PTSD, and we had the same result. Same result as the rats. Uh, but the rats make the human stuff real. And what's happened now is uh, we are in the midst of a little pilot trial. The first three guys just completed all their treatment and testing yesterday. All three of them are improved. We've got another group that are coming. And um, we just got an appropriation from Congress to do this on a larger scale in a, a randomized trial later next year. Anyways, thank you very much. <laughs>